just because we'll spend most of our time trying to review uh, and, and we don't want to, to, to belabor all that, we will kind of go over which ones we've talked about. We've talked about the scriptures. Uh, we've talked about uh, position there. Uh, we've talked about dispensation. Remember, we talked about that's just uh, breaking things down into bite-sized pieces. Uh, so we talked about that. Uh, we talked about the Godhead a little bit, a little bit uh, last week, uh, and and the position there, and the, the one triune God, and uh, just basically made some statements and gave you some scriptures uh, that go along with the idea of the three and one, and that's well, that's a that, that's a uh, that's a big subject to try to jump off into. So so far, that's the three areas we've talked about. Uh, today, we're going to move in a, a little bit further. We're going to go on to uh, the Godhead now, uh, or, or the person of Christ in the Godhead. We've talked about uh, uh, God the Father. We've talked about, started off with that beginning. Uh, now the Godhead. Now we're going to deal with the work of the work of Christ. And, and we'll follow that up with the work of the Holy Spirit. We'll just kind of work through uh, some, of these, some of these details, all right? Uh, so we've got the foundation of the Scripture. We've got a dispensational idea of breaking things down into bite-sized pieces so we don't become overwhelmed uh, by all the details that are there. Uh, then we begin the, 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 talking about the Godhead and introduce uh, the idea uh, of the, here, the Word. I know it's not in the Bible, but uh, the Word, the Trinity, or three in one. Uh, so we dealt with that. And now we'll dig a little bit deeper into the person uh, and the work of Christ. Now, a lot of the, the scriptures that, that are listed uh, on your paper are going to be on the screen, uh, so I'll not, uh, some will turn to just because of the length of the reading, uh, but for the most part, we're just going to try to do it on the screen and, and just try to, I figure that'd be the easiest way to do that. All right, so let's start with this statement. I told you we we're going to dispense with the introduction. That was it. You got it. We're moving. All right, so we'll start with the person and the work of Christ, and we'll start with this statement. We believe that the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, became man without ceasing to be God. Now, we discussed that a little bit last week, so we're not going to dig a lot there. That's just a statement of the Godhead. Uh, so we believe the Lord Jesus Christ, he is the eternal Son of God, yet he became man without ceasing to be God. Uh, and, and we'll just say it this way. We do believe that Jesus Christ is 100% God. Yet he is 100% man. Uh, well, how did that happen? Uh, he's a big God. That's all I can say. By faith, we believe what the Bible says. All right. So then we'll move on with that statement, and we'll get this. Having, be, having been conceived by the Holy Spirit. Now, mine is broken down. Yours is the whole statement. So we'll just take it pieces at a time. So we believe that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Why is that so important? And we, we can stop here and chase that rabbit for a while. Why is it so important uh, mm -hmm. that we focus on this statement? Why, why is that even in the statement that he's conceived by the Holy Spirit? Well, we're gonna, now we haven't, I know we haven't dealt with that yet. And we'll deal with it when we get to man. Uh, but we do understand uh, that, that the problem uh, is this. Our sin nature. And I know we've talked about this a little bit, but where did that sin nature come from? That sin nature came from Adam. Sorry, no. Right? I'll get to heaven and we'll punch him in the nose. <laughs> All, right. All right. That sin nature came from Adam. The Bible tells us in the book of Romans that about one man, sin entered in the world, death by sin. Right? So it was through Adam's sin, uh, fellas, just Adam's sin. Who sinned first, Adam or Eve? <laughs> Yeah, well, come on now. Right? It was Adam's sin. But death came. That's what the Bible says. All right? And then that sin was passed upon all men. So through our fathers, we have received a sin nature. So, so anybody in here that doesn't have a father, raise your hand. Amen. Rhetorical, right? We all have fathers. We've all received that sin nature. When we start talking about Christ and we start dealing with this idea of being conceived by the Holy Spirit... Christ did not receive the sin nature, right? Because he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He didn't get it through the bloodline. But we do understand, the Bible talks about this, and we'll stop and preach a little bit on this one, right? Uh, that he became sin who knew no sin. 
He did not receive a sin nature. He never sinned himself, yet he became sin for us. He had a choice, and we don't. Wow. He went, all right, I'm putting a whole other line on what Christ did for us, right? All right, so we talked about this idea of having been conceived by the Holy Spirit. Now, here's a, uh, the verses that go with that, Luke chapter 1, verse 35. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So we find in Luke chapter 1, just the direct statement of the angel speaking to, to Mary, uh, that the Holy Spirit would overshadow her. Uh, and, and again, that goes back to that whole idea uh, about the marriage arrangement and how Joe, the Bible says that Joseph did not know her until after the birth of Christ. Uh, you know, just an, uh, uh, an amazing way God put all of that together and just weaves that story and ties it all together. Oh, well, we have a great Bible. Amen. I have a great big God who gave us a great book. I get excited about that. All right. So then we talked about this, number two, or the, the next one, uh, statement. And, and he was born of the Virgin Mary. He was born, and, and you start putting all this. You break one link in this chain, you've got a problem. Uh, you, you, you've got a difficulty. All right? And he said this, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. You know, that may not seem as astounding to us today as it did to them. With all of the medical advancements that we've made and all of the science that we have now and the things that they can do and you know conception in a in, in a in a uh, petri dish or test tube or however you want to say that I, the devil is slick isn't he why do you think we can do all that stuff as the devil as the devil seeks to water down the word of God you're saying that's up the devil no I'm saying the devil's using that He's using that. Now, Bible days, we understand when he's talked about a virgin conceiving, that, that was supernatural. Uh, that's not something that just happened every day. All right? In order that he might reveal God and redeem sinful man. So now we're, we're getting into why he came. Well, we talked about the idea of the person, the work of Christ, that he was, he was eternally God, uh, that he didn't cease to become man, but didn't cease to be God that he was conceived of the Holy Spirit, that he was born of a virgin in order that he might reveal God and redeem sinful man. All right? Let's look at that. Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 6. The Bible says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. For unto us a child is born, a son is given. For what purpose? Uh, to reveal God and to redeem mankind. All right? That, that specific purpose there. John chapter 1, uh, verse 1 and 2, the Bible says this. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And then he says in verse 14, uh, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Look at this. And we beheld his glory, the glory of as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So, so we're finding this, this idea that he came, that he might reveal God to us, uh, that he might redeem mankind unto himself. Right? Um, I don't think I wrote this down, but, but to redeem, what does that word redeem mean? We, we think about re redeem. See, I, I think here's a good thing for us to do if we really want to be Bible students. Uh, it is to either get a hard copy uh, of Noel Webster's 1828 Dictionary, uh, or if you're like me and you're cheap, I mean, you're like me and you're frugal, <laughs> uh, you can't get it for free. You can download it on your phone. Uh, so, uh, and you don't have to carry the book that's, that's you know, this big uh, around with you. There it is. Yeah. So you can just pull it up right there. Now, why don't we, why don't we talk about this, though? Can we pause here and just take a rabbit? 
I'll be talking about the Noah, Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary. Why, why, why do we mention that specific one? Right. How many of us would, would understand uh, that words uh, uh, over time uh, have changed their meaning? Fifty years ago, you look this book, look this word up in a dictionary, and you look at that that word in the dictionary today is going to be two different definitions. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that's just that's just the nature of the language, right? And that's just an easiest one to to to, to, to pick on. Uh, there are others, but that's just an easy one, right? So we understand the English language words change meanings; they they adapt. Uh, you understand that there there are words today. Uh, if you look up fifty years ago. You look up a selfie 50 years ago, it's not going to be in the dictionary. Right? <laughs> um, it's just the, the, the language, the language of that. Okay. <clears throat> the reason we talk about an 1828 dictionary is because that's one of the oldest ones that's still in print that's, that, that holds the meanings of those words as close to uh, the King James that Bible that we carry. Uh, so we, we look up that word, we can understand what that word means. Right. Let, me, let me give you another one. There, there's a word in the Bible uh, that, that's done that that, that we, we talk about a, a lot, and we've talked about it before. How do you say spell that, Katie? I don't know what. Is that an irony? Replenish? Yeah. Is that an right. I can't even read it. That's right. Oh. I think. Yeah, it's anyway, I told you I can't spell. So. <laughs> Come on, baby. Give me. Give me. It's me. Sorry, it's me. <laughs> All right. How's that? That's, right. That's right. right. Replenish. All right. What does that word mean? No, it's not a trick question. To restore. restore. To restore. Right. <laughs> we, we look at that and we say to replenish. There's a. Yeah, you, we go to a restaurant, we have a glass sitting on the table, we want them to, to replenish or refill our glass. We ask them to replenish that glass. You look up this, this word in the, 18, uh, the 1828 dictionary, you're going to find that it doesn't mean to refill, replenish, and it's used in Genesis 1 or when it was Genesis 3, Genesis 3. Uh, where he gives the commandment to, to Adam and Eve, and then it's used again in, in Genesis 6, where he talks to Noah. Uh, but, but when he tells Adam and Eve to replenish the earth, he's not telling them to, redo, to redo it. He's telling them to redo it. Right? He's telling them to do it. So originally this word had carried with the connotation not to redo, but to, to do. All right? And, it's, and it's, it's changed over the years. So that, that's why we talk about it. Uh, uh, the 1828 dictionary, because a lot of times you can find uh, d just a little bit of, of, of uh, that little bit of shade of difference that you find in those words uh, that will help us with that understanding. I don't remember why I started chasing that around. Uh, so we're looking at this idea uh, of Jesus Christ uh, to oh, to reveal. That's what we're, to reveal, redeem. So so that word redeem. What does that what does that word mean? We start talking about. To, to redeem something. What 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 are we what are we what are we talking about? Buy back. To buy back. Okay. So we're looking at it, talking about Christ came to reveal God to man and to redeem mankind. Boy, and I like that definition to buy back. He came to purchase what was already his to begin with. That redeem carries with it almost the same idea of we're ransom to purchase back what's already mine, what already belonged to me. There's a lot of preaching right there in that word. Amen. I am glad he loved me enough to buy back what was already his. Well, you know that old devil, he's slick and he just, he snookered us and stole us all away. <laughs> no, he chose Adam original sin, he chose to walk away from God, but yet God bought us back anyway. Amen. All right, I can smile right there. You know, act like you're awake. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I know it's early. Get some coffee over there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, 
and hath commanded unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. To reveal Christ, to reveal God to us, and to redeem us unto God. That we might, he became sin, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. All right. Um, Comments or questions? You got it. You have to do it. way back, movie. Because I get preaching, and I don't slow down. Galatians chapter four, verse four, verse five it says, "But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons." Fullness of the time, no accident. No oversight, the determined plan of God. Before the foundations of the world, God knew exactly. And then again, we'll, we'll get back to, to Christ in the temple where he said, Wish you not that I must be about my father's business. All right? We're just talking about the personal work of Christ. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 8 says this, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Who being in the form of God, thought it not proper to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto the death, even the death of the cross. And we're just giving you different biblical examples of this, this statement, the personal work of Christ, that he came to reveal God and redeem mankind. All through the scriptures you'll find and we could go on quite a bit just dealing with that subject. All right. So we'll move to point number two under this idea of the personal work of Christ. So we believe that the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished our redemption through his death on the cross as a representative, vicarious, substitutionary sacrifice. Now, I don't know if you were taught this or not, but I was taught this in, in, in high school. Believe it or not, they did teach me something. Uh, that when I don't know what a word means, well, the first thing that we do to try to figure out what that word means is we look at the context of the sentence it's given. All right? So we start looking at that. There's a couple of words in there that kind of make my knees go weak. But, uh, you know, representative, not so much. But, you, you know, you get the vicarious. That one, that one kind of, you know, what? It's substitutionary. Yeah. i got to think about that one for a minute. Substitute. And, you know. That, yeah, the substitutionary is not quite so hard as it, when you stop and think about it. And what does that mean? Uh, you know, of course, to substitute. Uh, so in our place, so, so the representative, what does that representative deal with? Uh, it deals with taking basically um, uh, 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 doing the business of someone else, right? Uh, and taking someone else's place. So that word vicarious uh, what, what do you think that word might mean before we were even to look it up? Right, well, it's going to fit somewhere in the realm of what we were just talking about, right? So if you were to look up that word by Carrie and say, here's what it would mean. It would, be, it would mean filling the place of another. Filling the place of another. Now, it talks about a representative. And, and vicarious is very similar to that idea of a representative. The Catholic Church they refer to the Pope. Uh, one of the titles they give him uh, comes from this word. Can anybody guess what it might be? The vicar. They call him the vicar of Christ. And, and what it means is, in their theology, in their belief, uh, that while the Pope is performing his official duties here on earth, he is... A fill-in for Christ Himself. That's that's their theology, and it comes from and, and they use this word or the root word of that as their 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 foundation for that or, or to, to to express that. Right? Now, what we're talking about with Christ is He is standing in for us. It is an official term of Him officially assuming our place. And, and being 
be having all authority and, and all responsibility for us. Right? So the Bible said we believe that the Lord Jesus Christ, we're getting to the Bible in a minute, we believe that the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished our redemption through his death on the cross as a representative by carrying substitutionary sacrifice. So let's look at this. Acts chapter 2, verse 14 through verse 36. Now we're not going to read all of this. I started to do that, but for sake of time, we're not. But this is this is a sermon that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. Uh, you, you, you want to hear some good preaching. Uh, but we, all, we, we need to go back and just, one of these days I'm going to do that. One of these days I'm going to get a pulpit, and I am gonna, I'm just going to read Peter's sermon and have an invitation. Uh, you know, great preaching. Uh, but it, it, he proclaimed Christ as, most, as Messiah and, and called all men under repentance. Right? So we're talking about what well, all he did there on the day of Pentecost was say, it basically he started off with uh, Jesus Christ whom ye crucified and he goes for several verses you can see how, that may, how many there he goes through several verses and just presents Christ as Messiah their sacrifice that he gave his life for them. All right? So the whole preaching on the day of Pentecost thousands, thousands got saved from, that, from, from the, the Holy Spirit of God dealing through that message of the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ. Well, we might learn something right there. Amen. Uh, wait, let me back that up. Uh, uh, as preachers, we might be able to learn something from, from right there. All right. Romans chapter 3, verse 24 and verse 25, the Bible says this, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. Oh, goodness. Mm -hmm. There's another one in words. Uh, to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Romans chapter 3, this section, dealing with the idea of what Christ has done for us. So here, here's that big word, what we've talked about it before. But that word propitiation, do anybody, does anybody remember what we talked about that word being connected to, excuse me, in the Old Testament? Well, there, there's a significance there uh, of where that word, that, that word that's used in the New Testament uh, connects very closely to what's mentioned in the Old Testament in, in, in the Hebrew. Anybody remember? Ah, close. Now, I remember specifically, we did talk about this. That word propitiation is very, very keen or, or, or related to uh, what the same word that they get the, the mercy seat from in the Old Testament. It's, it's akin to that in the New Testament. When the Bible says that he is our propitiation, they're talking about that mercy seat where the blood was applied, uh, where God uh, paid for our sin on, cro on the cross, yes, uh, but that blood was applied to the mercy seat uh, bringing about the forgiveness of God uh, to all mankind. All right? So it says here that he is our propitiation. We're talking about the work, the personal work of Christ. Uh, he is that, uh, that sacrifice for us uh, as that mercy seat was that meeting place where God met man. Uh, it's in Christ uh, that we have redemption. All right? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live under righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Now again, we're just talking about specifically the sacrifice that Christ made for us. We bear our sins in his body. All right? Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 it says this, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Been studying uh, the last couple of weeks. We've been trying to get ahead uh, uh, for our lessons. We're looking at church history and going through some of that. And you understand <coughs> there are a lot of religions, be careful how I say that, a lot of denominations today that do not believe what Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 says. Very clearly, in whom we have redemption through his blood. 
If there was anything else that you had to add to the sacrifice of Christ, you think you think it would have been said or enumerated in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. We have redemption through his blood. All right, moving on. And that our justification is made sure by his literal, physical resurrection from the dead. Oh, you're one of those. Yes, I am. I believe that he literally, physically came out of that grave. Oh, boy, we'll talk about some more of that here in a little bit. All right. Uh, so, again, uh, what does that word justification mean? All right. Here, the best way for me to remember that? We're out of board. <laughs> Just as if I had never seen. Justified. The, uh, the, that ought to make a Presbyterian shout right there. I'm telling you, he, when God looks at us, he doesn't look at my sin. He doesn't, he doesn't look at, when he looks at me, he doesn't see my problem. He, doesn't, he sees the blood of Christ and he sees me justified. I get glory once just thinking about it. Because I know what's, what, what kind of sorry scoundrel I am. But if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. And that our justification. Did I say something? Okay. I don't want to, get, I don't want to, I don't want to miss anybody. And that our justification is made sure, oh boy, stop right there for a little bit, can, is made sure by his literal physical resurrection from the dead. First Peter chapter 1, verse 3, the Bible says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, he hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Well, you know, there's some that say, really, he didn't die. He just swooned on the cross, and they put him in that cool grave, and he revived, and, and they don't have a God. They don't have a Savior. Who says that? There are some religionists that will that teach that. Really? I can't even. Anybody in the medical field that's not. Right on the top. You know, uh, they, there are a lot of folks that, 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 I mean, there's a lot of theories about who Christ is, right? The Bible says very clearly uh, that he, by the hope of resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away. And that kind of, sounds kind of secure, doesn't it? That fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith, and the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. All right? Then we'll get to number three uh, of this idea, the person, the work of Christ. We believe that the Lord Jesus Christ ascended, ascended to heaven. He ascended to heaven. The Bible says Acts chapter 1 and verse 9, we have it clearly written for us. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly, you know what that means in the Greek? Look, that's a joke. Uh, yeah, I, can, I can just see Miss Katie just did. I can just see them all standing there going. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's almost, it's almost kind of like, you know, the, the angels came out and said, you know, close your mouth. Close your mouth. You know, <laughs> your mouth. <laughs> yeah. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Amen. And, they, and it goes on. I don't know if I put the rest of it in there or not. Uh, it goes on to talk about, you know, this same Jesus who, who, who shall come again in like manner. Amen. So we find that, the, the, again, why is it so important that we stand on what, that the Bible is the Word of God? Because, it, you know, if we say it contains the Word of God and parts of it are, what parts are not? No. The Bible is our final rule of faith and practice. We believe what it says. All right. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24, the Bible says, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, 
now to appear in the presence of God for us. Yes, he resurrected. Yes, he ascended. And he is at the right hand of the Father today. And that's the next statement. And is now exalted at the right hand of God. Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Who is, who is he that commendeth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. All right, can, can I ask you a question? Can we go back and... I mean, come here. Can we go back and ask you this? All right. Remember we talked about that? Three, the triune God. If he's one, and we saw that in, in scriptures, how is he sitting at the right hand of the Father? And I don't have an answer for that. I can't, I can't explain that, but I, but I can read the scripture that says he is. God is so beyond our understanding and so beyond our way of thinking. One of the biggest problems that we have as, as humans is trying to fit everything into how we understand and how we believe. All right? I, I was reading today, I was reading the Sword of the Lord this morning, uh, and I read across this old statement about it. An agnostic came and said, you know, if I can't explain it, I'm not going to believe it. Well, and here's the, there were several, three or four different things, but here's the first one that, I, that I've heard all my life I thought was funny. He said, well, then explain this for me. How does a black cow eat green grass Give white milk that turns into yellow butter. <laughs> well, you explain that one to me. I don't know. <laughs> but just because I can't explain it doesn't mean it don't happen. I had, I, you know, I like me a little butter, amen, on my, on my bagel. I like, you know, it, it, it's here. We got it. Where did it come from? I, I don't know how it happens. God does it, right? He, he, he put all that together. I can't explain all that, but I know the Bible says they are one. And then I understand Romans chapter 8 tells us that Jesus is now seated at the right hand of the Father, uh, making intercession for us. All right. Uh, we're going we're to try to finish the, 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 the personal work of Christ. Whereas our high priest, he fulfills the ministry of representative. Now there's that word again. Representative, intercessor, and advocate. All right. What's the difference between a representative and an advocate? You stand in place of someone okay. for them, so you, you act in their behalf, a representative. Okay. Representative, you stand in someone's place. An advocate, you act for them. Right? So there, there's the difference in the, the, the two terms of representative. It has to deal with action. All right? So he is our advocate. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for us. Not only does he say, I'm standing here for them, Father, but yet now he stands there and says, and I am praying for them, and I am pleading their case before you. Aren't you glad that we have someone God himself pleading our case. Amen. Mercy came on it. I like this song. <laughs> First John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation, there's that word again, for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That idea of the advocate standing before, before the Lord. All right. So next week we're going to pick up the personal work of the Holy Spirit. Now, again, I hope you understand this is not an, an exhaustive 
study of the person and work of Christ. I, I hope you've picked up on this already, but really what we're looking at are our adopted uh, uh, constitution. That this document, these things that we're looking at are articles of our bylaws. This is actually the statements uh, that, are, that, are, that were voted on by our church years ago uh, and set up as the foundational document stating what the church stand, where the church stands. I hope you've figured that already. Uh, but that's kind of what we're doing. It's just going through. Remember, we took it through. I'm going to make this connection. We're done. Uh, we took it through. We started off with, with Christ. Right? We started there in his teachings. Uh, and then we went into what we call the uh, biblical distinctives. Right? Uh, and we talked about history. We talked about following those through history. Uh, and, and then now we're talking about our doctrine uh, or the beliefs now. Okay? So we're trying, what we're trying to do is we're trying to connect these three. And just demonstrate how what we believe now agrees with what we've seen in history and is founded in what Christ gave us in the Word of God. Let's pray. Father, again, we're thankful for the day. What a joy it is just to be able to look into your Word and, and connect uh, some of these, these scriptures and some of these principles. Father, I pray that you'll help us to understand and see who, who you are to us and what we have in Christ. Uh, what a joy it is just to be able to understand uh, we have a God in heaven that looked down uh, and, and, and put forth the plan of salvation. And when the fullness of the time was come, uh, that Christ came and uh, became our representative. And our, 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 that he uh, gave himself and sacrificed for us. Uh, and then now he's our advocate that he's sitting uh, at the right hand of the Father making intercession. What a, what a privilege it is to be a child of the living God. We love you. Pray that you'll be with our services uh, upcoming. Pray for for. Uh, the next hour in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You will be